1992 was an amazing year for Amiga games, as you'll learn real soon. But first, let's have a quick update on the year's most important tech events. Microsoft released Windows 3.1 that sold 1 million copies in just under 2 months. And phrase surfing the internet was coined in February by a computer scientist one Mark McCahill. 1992 was also a year when very first reusable alkaline battery hit the market and Linux was released under GNU license. Wolfenstein 3D came out on PC marking a beginning of 3D first-person perspective shooter craze that stormed the world and became the most popular genre for the next few years. And in March, Intel released its 486DX2 CPU, which effectively doubled the clock speed of their previously fastest chip. Finally, OpenGL Standard was released, perhaps not as popular back then as it is now, in its latest evolved form of Vulkan, but it no doubt was a milestone. And it's the time where I usually ask you to smash that like button and hit subscribe. Despite what it may feel like, it's actually a huge help. You may also consider joining my Patreon, but you do you. These videos will always be free here anyway, just a day later than on Patreon. Same as they've always been. There are some other perks there too, but like I said, it's totally voluntary. Okay, before I get to the point, I'd like to give credit where it's due. Some of the footage for this video was sampled in small around the minute long parts from other channels. It's either because I couldn't get the particular game to run, or it would have taken a lot of time to get to the point that I wanted to show. Or finally, because I suck at that game and it was just more feasible to show someone who can actually play it. One way or another, all those incredible channels are credited both with a blue ribbon in the video when their footage is running and in the comment section below. And all of them deserve a subscription. They sure have mine. So, with all that out of the way, let's get to it. For this sports driving aka stunts, as I'll be calling it here, is a 3D racing video game with an emphasis on stunt tracks and built-in track editor that's surprisingly easy to use. And it's a part of 4D series of games, the other two being boxing and tennis, both mentioned in earlier videos in this history of games series. In stunts you race around the chosen or created track with the aim of completing the lap as quickly as possible without crashing. It wouldn't be anything special though if not for the fact that these are not your regular tracks. No, they are filled with various ramps, loops, jumps and other interesting stunt features. And you can race against the clock or a CPU controlled drivers in one of the 11 available cars. And while Amiga's 1.2 version of the game is the most recent and with most fixes as compared to other platforms, it doesn't run too great on basic Commodore systems. Neither A500 nor A1200 offer very enjoyable experience if you're not used to low frame rates. It's playable, don't get me wrong, but to appreciate it fully something like 68030 CPU or higher is recommended. What you're watching here is emulated very turbo Amiga 500, normally on original hardware the game does not run that well sadly. A-Train on the Amiga is actually a third game in Japanese series of business simulation video games originally known as Take the A-Train. In A-Train you're in charge of your own railway company and you have no rivals. Really, it's just you in the city in an open-ended game where you have to get as rich as possible and help the city grow in the process. So, you build railway stations, connections and you can transport passengers and building materials. First are more profitable and the latter allow city to grow as the materials are used for building, which in turn can have a positive impact on your passenger transport demands. City's expansion is automatic and you have very little direct control of it, but you can also invest in some buildings of your own, like hotels for instance, which could be another source of income. On the surface it may appear that A-Train is very simplistic, but there's a lot of deep underlying mechanics in play here, and it's really a rewarding title if given time. Agony is beautiful. Not an act of being in extreme pain or near death, no. The game. It's an art piece, it really is. The in-between level images, the backgrounds, the huge sprites. It's one of the best looking Amiga games, and not only in 1992, but overall throughout its lifespan. But what would the graphics be if the game was crap? A shell to hold nothing in it? Well, while Agony may not be the best horizontally scrolling shooter on the system, probably not even one of the best, it's definitely an A-OK -okay one. A bit slower paced than bullet hell titles arcades got us used to, but perhaps it's by design. To give player a feeling of traversal throughout those large beautiful areas, so that they could enjoy them as much as they enjoy the shooting. Or more even. Whichever way you look at Agony, be it as a game or an art masterpiece, it's a title that's worth experiencing, even if only once out of curiosity. I could say that Alien Breed Special Edition 1992 is the same game as Alien Breed I spoke about in the history of Amiga games for year 1991. And technically speaking that would not be incorrect. Because it is. But also isn't. Hear me out. 
While it's the same title, it's been re-released a year later with notable improvements. You could call it a patched version. And that's a novelty in itself, as in early 1990s patches were not very common. Coming back to our special edition though, it came with more levels than original and an eagerly awaited and wanted by the fans password system, that allowed continuing of adventure after a terrible failure. And believe me, you will fail in Alien Breed. Terribly. Regardless whichever one of them you play. Other than that, amazing graphics and sounds and dark sci-fi horror atmosphere is still here, and the gameplay is as good as it did originally, either in single or simultaneous two-player mode. Amberstar is a title in the Talion Software's Never Finished trilogy of role-playing games. The third and last title, Amber Worlds, was cancelled based upon poor sales of Amberstar and its sequel Amber Moon, which is a pity because despite the lackluster financial results, both games were actually very good. Amberstar makes a top-down view similar to that of newer Ultima games for overworld map traversal with first-person action dungeon crawling and combat. And while the graphics were clean and easy on the eyes, they were definitely nothing to write home about and little below what was expected on the Amiga in 1992. Story and role-playing elements, however, were carefully and interestingly crafted, creating a very unique and engaging experience. In short, you and your band of adventurers that you recruit along the way have to find and recover 13 pieces of the Amber Star Talisman used to banish main villain of the game. But don't let this overly simplified description fool you, the game is chock full of character and amazing adventures. We've spoke about a shooter with an O, it's time for one with a B. Apidia, despite the Japanese characters on the screen, is a German game and a horizontal scrolling back themed shooter. The game is a mixture between R-Type and Gradius. And while it's rather difficult, it's not as unforgiving as either one of the mentioned titles. It is divided into five levels, each split into smaller stages, usually three, where last is the boss stage. First boss is interesting in particular as it requires a very specific approach to survive, which I will not spoil here, but keep in mind that he's not to be tackled the way you would have tackled your usual shooter boss. Apidia offers few different weapons with a power-up bar system clearly based on Gradius and allows for charging your shot as in our type. It's another one of those unusually themed games that only Amiga had and a title worth seeing even if only as novelty. BAT2 The Caution Conspiracy is a futuristic point-and-click adventure game with some light role-playing and action elements and a sequel to 1990s BAT. In BAT2 you take a role of an agent of Bureau of Astral Troubleshooters sent off to Roma 2, the most important city on a planet which name I will no doubt butcher now badly, Shadishan, where you're supposed to investigate mysterious and unexplained murder of your fellow agent Sylvia Hartford who was actually a main protagonist in the first BAT. The game mixes adventuring with many bits and bobs taken straight out of other games, so while you work your way on the case in the usual point-and-click 2D style, you also engage in ship-to-ship -ship 3D combat and can even play games in the arcade. Presentation deserves special recognition as many of the backgrounds are animated featuring characters moving about, etc. It makes the areas you visit feel more natural, more plausible, if you will. BAT2 is a title that deserves a whole video of its own, and maybe, just maybe, it may get one at some point. BC Kit is a prehistoric era set action platformer that originated on PC Engine and then was ported to Amiga, NES, Game Boy and even arcades. Titular BC Kit is actually called Bonk and he's a strong, bold caveman. Or caveboy, I should say, really. Whose mission is to save Princess Za from Evil King Drool. Both being different type anthropomorphic dinosaurs. Interestingly enough, Bong doesn't defeat his enemies by launching projectiles at them or doesn't hit them with anything. He jumps, propelling himself upwards to gain momentum and then falls on them with his rock-hard forehead. The game is just beautiful and full of charm. Huge cartoony sprites, lush backgrounds and buttersmooth animation are top of the line for the Amiga in 1992. In fact, it's a title that graphically aged like a good wine. It's probably more appreciated now than it was back then. It's worth mentioning that BC Kit supports two button joysticks out of the box, which was not something that was common on the Amiga at all. Black Crypt is a first-person perspective dungeon crawling role-playing game, clearly inspired by Dungeon Master and Eye of the Beholder. At the start of the game you create your party of four adventurers and have to take them through 28 deadly levels of a dungeon appropriately named Tomb of Four Heroes, to defeat the main antagonist in the form of powerful cleric at the end of it or the bottom of it, depends how you want to look at it. The game also features mini-bosses on several of the levels, and interestingly enough, the first one is within just 20 spaces from the start location. So do whatever you want with that knowledge. What I always liked about the game was that the magic user in your party could via use of a spell, 
have the dungeon map itself automatically as you made your way through it. Technically speaking, Black Crypt was great. It used very seldom touch by the developer's so-called half bright mode that allowed 64 colors on screen at once, 32 unique ones and additional 32 at half the brightness for shading or color grading. Caesar is a city building game similar to SimCity but set in ancient Rome. Same as with all other city builders, you don't only oversee city's growth, but have to micromanage all the details that run it internally as well. Making sure that there's enough schools, theaters, bathhouses, libraries, amenities with sustainable distances from residential areas. The major difference from SimCity though, aside from overall team that is, is the fact that in Caesar you have to also micromanage your military. So you'll organize and fund armed campaigns against barbarians, making sure to cover all the expenses required for such endeavors. Pity that the battles of those units are not shown though. That, however, as far as I remember was fixed a year later in Caesar Deluxe. All in all, if you're a person that likes to make sure that all the screws are screwed tightly, all the things are neatly lined up on shelves and everything you do is done as optimally as possible, you love Caesar. Castle of Dr. Brain is a puzzle adventure game. Or to be more precise, puzzle game with some adventure-like story background. In short, you want to become Mad Dr. Brain's assistant, but to do so you have to solve his series of puzzles. And these puzzles are the main fare of the game. They vary quite considerably, and while most require skill in logic and maths, in general it's good to have knowledge in broad range of subjects. As you solve puzzles, you'll earn hint coins, that can be later used in helping you solve more difficult challenges. While Castle of Dr. Brain is really fun puzzler, if you like those kinds of games that is, graphics leave a lot to be desired. They clearly have been ported from PC's VGA version, but they don't look as if any care was taken to touch them up. So they appear like a straight downgrade to lower color count, made in any basic graphics editor. Sid Meier's Civilization is not only one of my most favorite series of games, but this, first installment, despite gamers' personal preferences, is arguably one of the top 10 most important games in history of gaming, overall, not only on the Amiga. I don't think there's anyone who haven't heard about, or at least have a passing knowledge of Civilization, but just to be on the safe side, I'll try my best to explain. The simplest way of describing what Civilization is, is try to comprehend the encompassing meaning of the word itself. Because that's what the game is. It tells a story, or more appropriately, you design with your actions and choices the story of your own nation, from prehistoric times to the future through all the eras in between. So, you'll build and expand cities, deciding what buildings and units should be produced in them, you'll exploit natural resources, expand into wider areas, explore the unknown and exterminate any and all enemies if need arises. On top of that, you'll be also directly involved in deciding how your nation's technological progression should look like. You'll directly control all units, both during war and in the more peaceful times, and you'll be the one who leads your people to glory. Or failure. If any of that sounds interesting to you, you owe yourself to try this gem of a game. And since the first civilization is the easiest in the series, it's an ideal gateway drug to that just one more turn disease. Covert Action is another of Sid Meier's titles. Coincidentally, another that's very good. It's an action strategy game with adventure elements. And you play a skilled and deadly free agent hired by CIA to investigate ongoing criminal and terrorist activities. You're either he or a she. Not many games at the time short of RPGs allowed for choice of gender, so that's perhaps a small but still welcome addition. The game is divided into missions, they're all time limited. So you have to uncover criminal conspiracy details in each before the time runs out. You do so by completing various spy-themed minigames, so there's combat, cryptography, driving and wiretapping involved. They're all pretty fun and reward details like locations, names and photos of people involved in a crime or connected to a game plot. After each mission you may also receive a promotion, so in a typical for Sid Meier's manner, the game is point-based. Meaning that at the end of it, same as in Civilization, you're compared in a score table against set named records. Crazy Cars 3 is amazing, and probably one of the very few titles that could honestly compete with Lotus Games for the crown of the best Amiga arcade racer. So, this is the third installment, we're in the video for 1992, where are the first and second game you may wonder? Well, they're hopefully forgotten by the history as they were god-awful. This, however, is Ace. The game is fast, silky smooth and beautifully crafted. Crazy Cars 3 decided to spice up the standard racing formula by adding many new and interesting mechanics. So you can upgrade your car, gamble betting on races and there are police chases plus a selection of characters to choose from. Obligatory Mr. T lookalike included. While I think that Lotus 2 was technically superior, I always found Crazy Cars 3 to just be more fun and addictive. 
The only downside of it being lack of multiplayer, which actually was kinda solved in the re-release couple of years later under the name of Lamborghini American Challenge. Curse of Enchantia was British developer Core Design's attempt at competing with LucasArts point-and-click adventure games. And I'm afraid that the word attempt is the keyword here. While the game is fun, full of humor and really well made, it's nowhere near the LucasArts quality. And all because of few minor issues it has. For one, it uses pictographic point-and-click interface rather than the word-based one. And certain objects can be interacted only if you're standing directly next to them, as only then they appear in separate bar which makes the whole control scheme rather clunky and unintuitive. Secondly, there are no dialogues in the game and in all quote-unquote conversations, pictures are used as opposed to words. It's an uncommon choice but also one that makes certain situations unclear. And lastly, Curse of Enchantia is kinda infamous for being incompletable without the walkthrough, because some of the puzzles do not follow a logical conclusion. It's a beautifully looking and sounding good first attempt with some novelties, but not a title to compete with the best. Degeneration is an action-adventure puzzle game that's one of the most unusual and interesting titles of 1992. It's set in Singapore in cyberpunkish environment and in a not-too-distant future of 2021. Future, eh? Funny enough, there is no word in the game about currently ongoing pandemic. Anyway, you're a courier making a delivery to a top researcher Jean-Paul Derrida who works on the top floor of French tech company's Genox Lab. Until you enter the building, though you are oblivious to the fact that genetically engineered bioweapons inside are running rampant. The game is an isometric view puzzler at heart and in each of interconnected rooms you go through, you need to solve a riddle of how to destroy all bioweapons and seal air vents that they infest rooms through. You'll be finding various helpful items and rescuing genlock survivors along your way. You will, however, not step from a path of a perfect courier, and you will eventually get to Derrida with his package. Or you won't, cause Degeneration is kinda infamous for its difficulty level. It is one of the most innovative attempts at the puzzler though, so if you've never seen it, give it a go. Dark Queen of Kryn, same as its predecessors, is a Dragonlance Advanced Dungeons and Dragons RPG game and the last part in the Kryn trilogy of Goldbox games. It's virtually the same as the other two and a decent conclusion to the long story. If you've played the earlier ones, you'll want to finish the narrative and see how it all ended here. Apart from some disk load time improvements, ability to use more than one disk drive and interface being cleaned up, not much has changed from previous outings. For better or worse. It's still same good old RPG with tactical turn-based combat, and a title that's while difficult is also incredibly fun and enjoyable to complete. Darkseed is a psychological horror point-and-click adventure game with digitized graphics in unseen outside of office software back then, high resolution. It portrays both our world and mysterious and dark version of it inspired by the work of H.R. Geiger, which gives the game very unique and gloomy atmosphere. Leaving the excellent presentation aside, Darkseed was another of those adventure games that, while being extremely linear, required very precise time management, as often missing doing one thing at the very specific time could render the game unwinnable. And the worst is, it didn't let you know where you've passed that point. So you end up playing it hoping for a conclusion, just to learn later on that it all was a moot approach. If you're careful or have a lot of patience, however, the game can be beaten using rinse and repeat approach. I don't subscribe to that game design choice though, as I find endless repetition boring. Let me start by saying that while Dune 2 is more popular of the two games, I consider first Dune to be more memorable title. It's a masterpiece that effortlessly blends the adventure, strategy and economic genres for a very enjoyable experience. The game loosely follows Frank Herbert's novel, with you placed in the shoes of Paul Artrice, with a goal of driving the house Harkonnen from the planet Dune. So in the adventure sections you'll be talking to various characters found in a book, and they will push the plot forward, while providing story background to all the strategy elements that you'll be in charge of. You'll mine spies, wage war and even work on ecological issues with the Fremen all to exploit the planet for the priceless spice and to get rid of Harkonnen. Once that spice starts flowing, since it's also a currency used for all the purchases, the Emperor will begin making demands for regular shipments, and you'll have limited time to fulfill them, or otherwise he will invade Dune and game will end abruptly. Dune is neither the best strategy nor the adventure game really, being extremely linear to the point of view, taking part in most interactions more as a passive witness rather than a person who can actually influence the choices taken. But those parts put together make for an atmospheric and fun game. Elvira 2 The Jaws of Cerberus is a better of the two Elvira games that came out on the Amiga. Not that the other one was bad, this one's just better. And yet again you'll in a horror role-playing adventure mashup, this time playing as Elvira's boyfriend who has to save her. 
she's been captured by the free-headed demon Cerberus that wants to use her powers for his own gains. If you think about it though, how big her powers could realistically be if she was being captured left and right between both games and couldn't get out on her own accord. Unless her power was the ability to spawn instant arousals in her male counterparts. Then yeah, I see it as being plausible. Anyway, this time you're not in the castle but are working away through a horror movie studio, where all the props and movie sets turned into real monsters. All because of the studio being built on ancient haunted grounds. And same as last time, you play from first person perspective moving on a tile based grid maps. Unique feature of Elvira 2 was the magic system that often called for use of specific items to cast spells, like glass object or a liquid. And they could be various items picked up throughout the game, as long as they filled the criteria. Eye of the Beholder 2 The Legend of Darkmoon is eagerly awaited by fans sequel to the first title from prior year. It's also a first-person perspective tile-based movement role-playing game set in advanced Dungeons and Dragons universe. Unlike the previous title though, this time outdoor areas are added and the amount of interaction with various objects and environment is considerably expanded making for a more involving role-playing experience. The main fare, however, are the vast catacombs beneath the Temple of Darkmoon, upper levels of said temple and its three towers, silver, azure and crimson. And you'll be crawling through there to find and finally defeat the high priest Drandragor, who's not what he seems, but I suppose his surname gives it away anyway. And he's amassing an army of skeletal warriors to attack and take over Waterdeep. While Fire and Ice was never my favorite platformer, it's easily one of the best on the Amiga. Technically speaking, it's very impressive, mixing and matching colors in such a way that it appears as if there was many more of them than they actually are. And using big, butterly smooth animated sprites with an equally impressive reflection makes for a very good looking game. Your goal in each level is to find broken into several pieces key, the level exit door and then unlock it with that key. Pieces are dropped by defeating enemies so you'll be hunting them in each stage. The main weapon at your disposal is Cool Coyote's Ice Cold Speed that does no damage but temporarily freezes monsters. You defeat them by touch while they're in this frozen state. So you could say that your weapon is quote-unquote bad touch. The levels are quite varied and the game is generally fun, short of a bit slippery for the lack of a better word controls. At least that's how I perceive them, even now, 30 odd years later. Nearly everything in Fire Force's design is interesting, short of time limit, but we'll circle back to that in a moment. In essence, it's a horizontal scrolling action arcade game that puts you in shoes of a special forces agent that has to perform various randomly assigned missions. So you'll perform stealth killings, plant explosives and kill all the bodies that you can lay your eyes on, among other. The game is very replayable because of that and also because there's quite a lot of items to pick up in various tents, buildings and from defeated enemies. Which given the time limit means that you can't always check everything out in one go. Fire Force is quite graphic in some of the marines actions depiction and today it would have probably gotten some kind of mature or late teen rating. But back then we just played anything we could get our hands on and there was virtually no control over it other than the parents. I don't know about yours, but mine were totally oblivious to what I was playing and doing. Coming back to that time limit though, it's brutal. I mean the game is difficult on its own, but that counter seems to be chosen for each level in exactly right amount to complete it. Fully running, not stopping at all and without making any mistakes. Which you know, some cracks fixed, but it's hardly a solution if you have an original. I'm not sure if it was same everywhere, but where I grew up there was a common urban myth that Flashback was a sequel to another world. Which, as we very well know now, is not the case. Sure, both games have the same developer and similar fluidly animated style with numerous animated sequences and incredible intros, but that's about it. They are separate entities. Flashback is a cinematic action platformer set in a futuristic slash cyberpunkish environment that is best known for its atmosphere and lifelike character animations. It didn't hurt that it played pretty well either. The level design however is what I think is the most prominent feature here. All the enemy placement and puzzles require careful route planning and most importantly strategic approach. Running in willy nilly guns blazing rarely ends up being successful outside of first couple of levels maybe. Flashback is a timeless classic that was ported to nearly all systems available at the time and to many more current ones too. First two titles out of trilogy of Goblin's Point and Click Adventure games were released on the Amiga in 1992. Both games were a huge success and were easily recognizable among a sea of various adventure games, wider unique comical graphic style, mumbling incomprehensive ultra fast speech and humor. The most memorable feature of Goblins are the puzzles that allow for approach with various interactions and objects, often completely useless in solving them. But with these attempts always resulting in fun and quirky animations, showing your little protagonists either failing or getting hurt. 
so it was as much a puzzle game as it was a game of multiple tries. Which, come to think of it now, seems like was a design choice. Because many of the puzzles do not follow any logic in their solutions and are based, it seems, on you enjoying those little outcomes until you hit the nail on the head with the right one. Not to say that the game was completely random, because it wasn't. But let's say that if you play Goblins the way you would have played any other adventure game, looking for logical paths and if this then that solutions, you'll have most fun but also will progress much much slower. Historyline is a spin-off from Battle Isle series, taking part during World War I. It's a turn-based strategy for up to two players taking place on a hexagonal grid map. The game campaign tells the story of German forces invading France, and you can pick either of the sides to play as. As much as the 24 mission campaign is fun, the game really shines in multiplayer and offers 12 dedicated maps for this mode. Although History Line was quite popular, it never really reached heights of Battle Isle, and hence for a real plant other games in the historical series were canned. Humans is a puzzle platformer that's one of the most unusual games of 1992. The goal of the game usually is to get all of your humans to the level exit. To do so you have to use various abilities that they get along with progressing through levels, and this can range from forming a human pyramid slash ladder, to using tools like spears, torches, wheels and ropes to name a few. The Lemmings inspiration in humans is quite obvious, but despite that the game stands on its own feet. The titular humans are much bigger than the few pixels inside Lemmings, and the game itself is more strategic and not an arcade. You have a very direct control of each of your characters and their skills. It's not the best puzzle game on the Amiga, but definitely one of the most unique. Indie Hit is a port from arcades, and funny enough, while it may not look better, it plays better than the original. It's not overly difficult and is just fun to dive into. Especially in two-player mode when you can compete with your buddy on numerous top-down view tracks trying to one-up each other. Having drinks or beer while doing so is advisable for ultimate enjoyment of this title. Indie Hit is an arcade racer where you have to keep a constant eye on your turbo and gasoline levels. When the gas runs out your car slows down to a crawl, so whenever you're close to depleting it, you should get into the pit stop ASAP. Sure, while you're there, all the other cars keep racing, but since everyone needs to do so at least two three times per race, timing is the key to victory. Jaguar XJ220 is clearly inspired by the Lotus series. And if you have no Lotus or Crazy Cars 3, it's a decent substitute being a pretty good arcade racer. If you however have any other of the mentioned titles, you may as well skip the Jaguar. It's not a bad game per se, but it's a bit samey. All the cars and roadside features seem identical to one another and it just feels bland. Still, the feeling of speed and competition is here, so if you're all about that and have no other similar games, you'll have fun with Jaguar nonetheless. Gym Power in Mutant Planet is a run-and-gun action platformer that's very console-like in its design and quality. Meaning it's incredibly colorful with what seems to be way more than 32 colors on screen at once. In reality there's no more but they're very neatly mixed and the basic Amiga's chipset is really put to the test here. The sprites are huge and butter smoothly animated and there are multiple levels of beautiful parallax scrolling. The game offers flying shooter sections every once in a while to stay fresh and huge boss fights that heavily rely on pattern memorization. Gym Power is not the best playing platformer on the system, but it's definitely one of the few with best presentation. Access Software's Links, designed by Carver Brothers of Leaderboard fame, is probably the best golf game on the Amiga. Although it's the slowest loading game I have ever seen on any system to date, it's perfectly crafted simulation that's just a treat to look at and a blast to play if you're patient. While PC version used beautiful VGA 256 color palette, Amiga's version beats it by using a full spectrum of ham graphical mode, so 4096 colors all at once, on the very basic A500. And games that achieve that feat can probably be counted on just few fingers, of one hand. In fact, off the top of my head I can't think of any other. Anyway, as golf games go, this one simulates the sport best as possible on 16-bit systems and uses digitized graphics for a modern looking at the time presentation. Today's golf games may be better, but if you give links a bit of your time you'll quickly find that it's as entertaining now as it always was, even 30 years after its release. There are two games called Locomotion on the Amiga, the one that you're watching now and much worse released a year earlier, being a conversion of C64 game called Loco. The title and the fact that they're both trains themed is all they have in common. We're not gonna waste any more time on the crap one however, this locomotion is a fantastic puzzle game that's also quite challenging. But not in a frustration inducing way, more in a I know I can do better next time way. While the premise is simple, the fact that the game runs in real time makes for very adrenaline filled puzzling. There are letter named train stations and trains are going between them. 
challenge comes from making sure that the trucks are correctly switched to get them to their destinations without crashing. And since they all run at once, it can become hectic easily. While the most people consider Lotus 2 to be the best in the series and the best arcade racer on the Amiga, I think the last, third installment is equally as good. Even if not by much the graphics have been polished to the absolute maximum basic Amiga could handle, and the game as always runs super smooth scaling those sprites beautifully. It's also quite huge considering that it fit on two floppies, offering 13 different types of scenery and free cars to choose from. The two player split screen is obviously still here, and it's as fun as usual, and a welcome addition of Rex, a sort of simple track editor, extends the life of Lotus 3 considerably. Near infinitely in fact. Lure of the Temptress is a point-and-click adventure game with few and far in between, but nonetheless still present, arcade battle sequences. But that's not the only unique feature of this title. Arguably, aside from its odd mixture of humor and serious storyline, the most prominent feature is Virtual Theater Engine, which allowed in-game characters to wander around the game world independently of each other and player actions, performing their everyday tasks. This made the game world feel more alive, more natural and was used in some other future titles namely Benefia Steel Sky and first two Broken Sword games. Story-wise, Udiermo, a peasant, a beater for the king's hunting party, and by a series of unfortunate events that led to king's early demise, you're the only one left to defeat the evil enchantress Selina, the titular temptress. The Manager is my second most favorite football management game on the Amiga, only better by the Ultimate Soccer Manager. It's also the first football manager that I've ever played, so my opinion may be a bit biased. It's an interesting title because it's one that doesn't require intimate knowledge of the sport to be enjoyed and offers very fun multiplayer mode for up to 4 players on one machine. And to this day I remember wasting whole nights with my two cousins just running our teams against each other and trading players. Sure, it's a bit more basic title compared to others in the genre, especially when it comes to ways you can earn money or how in-depth you can get with the whole tycoon elements of running everything in the club and not only the team itself, but it more than makes up for it with playability, ease of access and pure fun. Might and Magic 3 Isles of Terra is the best and most modern in its design and presentation out of all legendary Might and Magic games released on the Amiga. It's a first-person party role-playing game with tile-based movement and turn-based combat. It's also the first title in the series that supports mouse control, which may have not been novelty in 1992, but for the series it most definitely was something that made lives of players much easier. The game also offers auto-mapping feature and maps larger than previously available, exceeding earlier limit of 16 by 16 squares. The biggest new feature of Might and Magic, however, was ability to save game virtually anywhere short of one location in the game, which removed the need for players to constantly keep locations of ins in mind, as saves could only be made there previously. I realized that I said nothing about the story, but given that Might and Magic 3 is still considered as one of the best RPGs of all time, I suppose it's best not to spoil it. Monkey Island 2 Lechak's Revenge, second outing in Monkey Island series, while perhaps not being as influential as the first title, is still nearly as good and one of the very best point-and-click adventure games ever released. Many things have been improved, from graphics that have a bit more animated movie look to them, to the interface and cinematic feel of the adventure. The traditional for the series swashbuckling comedy atmosphere is omnipresent and will keep you laughing from start to finish. Once again, your guy Bruce Freepwood, who's finally a pirate. Perhaps one that other pirates laugh at, but a pirate nonetheless. And this time you're on a quest to find the Big Whoop. A legendary treasure that's said to be bigger, better, treasurier than all the riches of the richest. Yep, one of this is not a word. Anyway, I'm sure title gave it away, but once more you'll face Lechak. This time, zombie fight. Monkey Island 2, same as its predecessor, is an experience that all gamers, regardless of what their fave genres are, should dive into at least once. It's worth it. Toasty! No Second Prize is a game I always forget about. And that's also the reason why it's not in my best racing games on the Amiga list. And whenever I talk about it, I call it Vroom, which would not be an issue if Vroom wasn't entirely a different game, made by a different company using different graphics engine and based around different vehicles. But that all is irrelevant, really. No Second Prize is amazing, full 3D motorbike simulation that runs surprisingly well on all even very basic Amigas. To the point that it's probably the most fluid 3D racer on the system throughout its whole lifespan. The game uses very intuitive and super smooth mouse controls, which may sound like a bad choice, but it's not only quite fitting, but also feels very natural while racing. Unless you're me, that is, and cannot at all control the bike on modern minds under emulation. But this may be an issue that's common to me and not anyone else, so I won't hold it against no second prize. 
To summarize, it's incredibly fun and fast bike simulation that would have easily gotten on my top 10 races list if I wouldn't forget about it 5 minutes after playing it last. Pinball Dreams is one of my most favorite pinball games on the Amiga. Also most likely first real pinball simulation on the system. With early attempts being lackluster at best and terrible at worst. This Digital Illusions title is very solid all throughout. It offers 4 differently themed and playing tables. So, there's Ignition, a rocket space traversal themed table, simplest in design out of all 4, but fun anyway. Steel Wheel, my personal favorite spaghetti western table, Beatbox, a modern at the time music themed table, and last but not least Nightmare. Horror, nightmares and all kind of monsters is what it's all about. While the ball physics are not perfect yet, they are believable and lack of impossible ramps, platforms or features on all four tables makes Pinball Dreams a very realistic experience. Released in the same year as Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies is my most favorite computer pinball of 2D era of games. Ball physics and graphics have been slightly improved and in general Fantasies feels like a bit more polished product. It also offers four differently themed tables, they are more advanced however, Still realistic, but offering more variety and things to unlock, trigger and get points on. And with use of dot matrix display simulated in the game, some mini games on it are also available when unlocked by special events. The tables are Partyland, my absolute favorite, funfair slash amusement park themed one, Speed Devils, a racing table, this one I spent the most time playing as a kid against my cousin who was a car nut. Then there's a billion dollar game show. My best friend at the time did some crazy high scores on it. And it's a TV game show team table. And finally, Stones and Bones. A better version of Nightmare Table from a previous game. Pinball Fantasies is amazing and one of my absolute most favorite games on the Amiga. Team 17's Project X is a horizontal scrolling shoot em up similar in its design to Gradius and R Type. The game's presentation is top notch. Both graphics and sound are great, in the very standard Team 17 got us used to. Project X is built out of 5 big levels and offers 7 different weapons to choose from. Guns, build-up, side-shot, homing missiles, plasma, magma and laser beam. It all sounds great but the game is hell, and not in a symbolic meaning. Now, I truly believe that if hell existed, then people sent there would be sat down at flickering screens of old CRTs and given Project X to play. It's so difficult that it became infamous for that and historically speaking apparently hardly anyone ever completed level 3, which prompted Team 17 to release Special Edition a year later. A virtually identical game but considerably less difficult. Pushover has it all. Graphics, music and sound, excellent even if short animated introduction and most of all addictive gameplay. The Quavers product placement is largely irrelevant as it doesn't affect the gameplay in any way. The idea here is simple. All yellow dominoes have to be knocked over in each level always ending with a very specific one. And since there are many different kinds of those, each with unique behavior, the gameplay is challenging but incredibly fun not only to play, but also to work out. Great game and a hidden gem that many do not know about. In the end, even though it may not be as remembered as some other games in the genre are, for me, this, along with One Step Beyond, are the best puzzle games on the Amiga. Maybe short of Lemmings that was just on another level. Rampart is an arcade port so technically could be best classified as an arcade strategy. The game progresses in pairs of stages, where first one is always a defense stage, where you have to destroy as many attacking ships as possible in given time, and second is the main meat of the game, the fortifications building stage, during which you have to assemble as good defenses as you can using Tetris-like shaped wall fragments. They can be rotated freely and have to be placed around castles. The more castles they encompass, the more points you'll get to build cannons. Keep in mind however that at the end of this stage at the very least one castle has to be completely surrounded by walls, as otherwise the game is lost. So what's so strategic about it? Well, aside from the arcade defense bit, you have to calculate and manage your time strategically to best optimize your division between securing kept castles and expanding towards new ones. It sounds simple but can be very hectic and most importantly very very fun to play against another player. Red Baron is my most favorite World War I themed arcade simulation of aerial combat. It's set on a western front and you can either partake in singular missions of various kind or play a career mode flying for either German air service or real flying corps. So you might end up eventually in Manfred von Richthofen, titular Red Baron squadron or fighting against him, depending on how well you do. Each successful shooting down of enemy planes is counted and counter kept by the game as players promotions are based on that. Red Baron is much more of an arcade game than a simulation, but it's for the best really, as the game can be enjoyed for what it is without the need to learn complicated controls and dozens of switches and levers to keep an eye on. 
Road Rush may very well be just a Mega Drive port. It may not be as technically advanced as many other games on this list, and it may not sound or look the best. But, uh, but it's one of the first few games I had on my Amiga, and it was, and still is to this day, one of the most fun racers on 16-bit machines. The tracks are interesting and varied, and it's equally as enjoyable to simply race on them as it is to smash your opponents or kick them off their bikes. It's not as smooth as Lotus 2 is, or as graphically impressive as some newer games are, but it doesn't have to reinvent the wheel when it's just plain fun to immerse yourself in. It's a cool little game that, while perhaps simple, is something that no other game tried to replicate and that makes it important and worthy of being in this video. Robocop 3 is an entirely different game to the previous two side-scrolling to the outings. Perhaps it's for the best. Sure, it's a game that proved that while it was possible to run it on a basic A500, it was not the best choice and A1200 should be considered as a bare minimum for enjoyable gameplay. Interestingly enough, Robocop 3 came out a bit before the third movie did, so it's not related to it in any way. The game was famous for being probably the first ever to feature a full 3D cityscape and first-person perspective shooting section entirely driven by mouse controls. Which may not have been the most comfortable, but was quite immersive at the time nonetheless. Saber Team is a strategy game with tactical turn-based combat. It may only contain 5 missions, meaning it's a bit on a shorter side, but the tactical aspect of it is so well executed that you'll end up playing it more than once anyway. If you like those kinds of games, that is. It takes place on a tactical isometric view maps where you command your small Spec Ops team, the titular Saber team. Judging by the graphics and actions available to your little troops, it was no doubt in no small part an inspiration for later titles like UFO Enemy Unknown and Jagged Alliance. The game is not the easiest, especially in missions with hostages, but given how fun it is, it's good because it allows for multiple playthroughs. Presentation-wise, the game is pretty good. Perhaps not the best for 1992, but there's nothing to pick on here. The first Sensible Soccer came out in 1992, and regardless if you liked it or not, you have to agree that it changed the Amiga football gaming scene forever. While not everyone may subscribe to the idea that Sensi was the best footy on the Amiga, most did and the game gained a cult following. Personally I liked it, but always sucked at it, so couldn't make that connection that made others love it. In fact, Sensible Soccer is so popular that the tournaments in it are still being played to this day, on original Amiga hardware no less. Technically speaking, it's nothing to write home about, but the tiny cute players, pixel perfect collision detection and hectic, incredibly fast gameplay is what stole the hearts of sport lovers in the 90s. While still beautiful and technically impressive, Shadow of the Beast 3 does not leave you out and impressed as previous titles did. But just because it's not as stunning doesn't mean that it's bad. In fact, it's the best playing out of all three games and honestly, in terms of gameplay there's no competition. This finally can be called a real, perhaps difficult but enjoyable platformer and not a presentation of Amiga's capabilities. The levels are a bit smaller, more contained, but much more better designed with no random and endlessly spawning enemies. Shadow of the Beast 3 is a first game in the series that feels as it was designed to be played and not only looked at. And it's the only game out of all three that I actually like to play. Sim End is most unique and innovative game of 1992 on the Amiga. It's designed by famous Will Wright and I could best describe it as part game, part ant colony simulation. You manage black ant colony in someone's backyard and have to expand said colony, ultimately leading it to spread all over the garden, into the house and finally to drive out opposing red ants and humans out of their house. Interesting concept was the ability to control one of the ants directly, searching for food, expanding your underground anthill, if it can even be called that, and battling against other insects. Perhaps Cement was not as good or well received as other sim games, especially that it offered win conditions and wasn't open-ended as the others were, but it was a very unusual and quite enjoyable title. As you can probably see on the screen already, Street Fighter 2's Lemon Amiga score is 5.70, which is only that higher than the average. Why would I play such game on this list then? Well, despite its multiple shortcomings that we'll talk about in a moment, Street Fighter 2 was a proof of concept that premium arcade versus fighting game could be ported to the basic 1MB Amiga. It's not a great port, blend in its color palette with many of the animation frames reduced or missing and jerky movement as a result of that, but it works. All stages, including the two bonus ones, all characters, their regular and special moves are in the game and, technically speaking, it's fully working and completable from start to finish. In fact, I, being a fan of arcade original, played it quite a lot until better ports like Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers were released on the Ami. Ugh, or however you want to call it, is not your everyday platformer. 
In fact, you don't walk around around platforms at all. Instead, you're a pilot picking up and delivering passengers between them. And as much as it may seem odd and boring, the gameplay is extremely addictive. There are numerous enemies and environmental obstacles, and the platform placement along with time limits proved to be a great formula for progression. Really cool game and one that everyone should try, as it's a hidden gem among hundreds of semi-platformers on the Amiga. And while Ark received ports to many systems, I always found it to be the most playable, most genuine here on the Ami. If you saw no reason in early 90s to upgrade your Amiga, Ultima 6 was one. On A500 with a single floppy drive it not only was as slow as a snail, but also all the disc juggling was borderline, obsessive compulsive inducing after a while of playing. Apparently the reason for that was the fact that it was lazily ported from PC, using hardly altered codebase without any Amiga optimizations. On 6830 CPU with some extra RAM, Ultima was a very playable title however. It is also considered one of the best and most important role-playing games in history of gaming. It offered pretty good graphics for the time, vast and non-linear story, and world as open as virtually none other at the time. You could immerse yourself in seemingly pointless tasks, living your life in a game, baking goods or fishing. You didn't have to follow the main questline, it's advisable obviously, but not necessary. One of the biggest changes between Ultima 6 and earlier titles was the change of in-game perspective, which was now single plane top-down semi-isometric view without separate screens for towns, cities or dungeons. Instead of being icons on the main map, they are de facto parts of the map now. This choice makes Ultima a much more immersive game than it would have been otherwise. Wing Commander is a space combat simulation game designed by then-famous Chris Roberts. Now he's kinda infamous as his Star Citizen that's been in development for the bigger part of the decade and is still crowdfunded today is nowhere near the release it seems. But all that aside, the game has a story and presentation that seems to be Star Wars fans' space dogfight dream. It features many different races and sides to the conflict that Mr. Roberts himself described as World War II in space. And even though I preferred Frontier to Wing Commander, I have to say that the game is quite fun to play and I understand its popularity. Wing Commander uses very simple but quite enjoyable for the player dynamic mission feature. Meaning the better you do, the more offensive your missions in the campaign will be. And if you fail a lot, many of these will be purely defensive in nature. While the basic version of the game on the Amiga is not great, CD32 outing is stellar, looking as good as on PC and running super smoothly and that's the one I would recommend. Wolfchild is 8-way scrolling action platformer. Biotechnology researcher Carl has been kidnapped by the evil Chimera organization and you, as his son Sol, use one of his inventions to turn yourself into half-man half-wolf to defeat the evil company. And the logic behind that choice escapes my understanding. Anyway, at least that's what the animated introduction tells us. The game looks and sounds great, and no wonder as the developer is responsible for an earlier Switchblade 2 title. Wolfchild's level design is pretty good and the enemies and bosses are quite interesting. That said, unavoidable deaths and pointless constant enemy respawns coupled with pretty high difficulty level make Wolfchild at times more annoying than fun. So approach at your own discretion. Xenon 2 Mega Blast is vertically scrolling shoot em up. The Bitmap Brothers graphics are easily recognizable and of their usual high quality. The sounds of shots, explosions and everything in between are very enjoyable too. And that's pretty much everything good I have to say about it. I don't like it. Never did and most likely never will. The graphics are beautiful and detailed, it's a fact, but the color palette makes it seem all samey all throughout. With shades of brown and grey blue seemingly used to build the whole game world. It's boring. Gameplay wise it's so so, could be better, could be worse, but the frame rate is beyond terrible and leaves a lot to be desired running at supposedly 25 FPS but feeling like half as much. So yeah, historically it was an important and well received title that I never found a single reason to like. 1992 follows the trend of last few videos having some of the best Amiga games released. There are quite a few of my favorites here too, but having to finish this video makes me happy for a completely different reason. Next video will cover 1993, a year that I always considered best for Amiga gaming, and working on it will allow me to confirm or deny that thesis and satisfy my curiosity. Hopefully it will also give us something to talk about in the comments. So if you like the video smash those like, subscribe and bell buttons below. If you do, my videos will always drop in a subscriptions as soon as they are released, so weekly. And if you're in a more generous mood you may also consider joining my Patreon or a small donation. All the details are in the description below. It will help me make better content and upgrade my editing and recording gear. Maybe even get a camera, who knows? For me, however, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time.